What's happening? You know, I want to say a special welcome to all of the vets. If we could just have people that have served in some branch of the service, if you would just stand, we'd like to say thanks to you for what you have done. Man, praise God for all of these. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Man, praise God. Freedom isn't free. It cost a lot of people their life and a lot of people a lot of time overseas and away from their families, and we just appreciate all that you've done. All right, I'm going to be sharing on healing, and I'm going to be teaching, as Dwayne said, different every single time. So I don't know that, what that does to the crowd if you want to stay over for the second. I don't know, but anyway, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be building, and then tonight we're going to have a healing service, and we're going to be praying for people. And I tell you, we have seen some great great miracles uh we've got a lot of them documented down here the petersons are on one of them and uh he was just basic well he he was raised from the dead you were dead for a while and so anyway my own son i was telling uh Dwayne and Jeannie we were talking about our families and i've only got one granddaughter and they've got 19 grandkids but i've got some bragging rights that nobody else has and that is that my granddaughter was born a year after her dad died. Not many people can say that. But my son was dead for five hours and in a morgue, in a cooler, stripped naked with a toe tag on. And they called me and we spoke and God raised him up. He started talking and came back from the dead after five hours. And... Um, no brain damage. No more than he had before, praise God. <laughs> so, anyway, I've seen some great things happen. Saw my wife raised from the dead. So I've seen two out of the three family members that I have raised from the dead. I told my oldest son, I'm tired of this. I want him to stay alive. <laughs> but anyway, I don't claim that I've got it all figured out. I certainly don't. But you know what? I have seen God do a lot of things. And I know that it is God's will for you to be well. And I know that Dwayne and Jeannie teach on this. And so a lot of what I'm going to say today will be repetitious. But when I was a pastor, I loved to have visiting ministers come in and say the same things it you know you just say it from a different perspective and it might reach people or if nothing else it validates that your pastors aren't weird amen there's other people that believe this so anyway I know that we'll be going through some of the same things but um, I have seen thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people healed and I know that the same thing will work for you how many of you in here need a healing in your body I think that this would still apply. Amen. <laughs> Seems like we got a lot of people. So let me just start over here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And this verse says, Who um, his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, that being dead to sins, might live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And again, this is something that could be developed in a lot more detail. But did you know that healing is not an appendage or it's not an add-on to the gospel? The church has pretty much, uh, I'm talking about as a whole, the universal church has pretty much made healing something that is additional. Maybe God can do it, but you never know what God's going to do. But if you were to look up the word for uh, salvation in the Bible, the one that's used over 300 and something times, so, so it literally is translated healed, like in James chapter 5, where it says, if any sick, let him call for the elders of the church, pray over him, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. It's not talking about forgive the sins, it's talking about healing your body. Healing is as much a part of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ as forgiveness of sins is. It's not separate. You know, my dad died when I had just turned 12 years old, and he was the chairman of the deacons, and he loved God. But we didn't have faith for healing because we didn't teach on healing. We just taught about forgiveness of sins. But healing is a part of the atonement. Jesus died for your sickness and your disease just as much as he died for your forgiveness of sins. And I'm going to make a statement here that is radical, and some people think that I'm weird, but I think you're weird. So... But I would no more be sick than I would go sin. 
I fight sickness the same as I fight sin. I hate sickness. I don't embrace sickness. I don't say that, well, it's flu season, and I guess I'll have to be sick. There's a lot of people that just think sickness is normal. It's normal for people that don't know the Lord. And it's normal for most Christians who don't know what Jesus has purchased for them. But Jesus died to heal you of sickness and disease as much as he died to forgive you of sin. And in the same way that you ought to resist adultery and say, no, I won't do it. You ought to resist being sick. Amen. I'm not saying that God hates you. I'm not saying you're a bad person if you're sick. But I'm saying that you aren't receiving what the Lord has for you. And this is one of the important things about healing is that you've got to get to where healing isn't optional. There's a lot of people that will sit there and they will embrace headaches. They will embrace the flu. They'll embrace things. I'm getting older and so I just have to start having some pains and stuff. And you accept it. That's the reason that you're sick. You know, I can, I'm saying this bragging on the Lord, not on me. But it's been 50 years that I've been in ministry. And for about the last 48 years, I've learned the truth, 47 or 48 years. And there's only been twice in 48 years that I've been sick. And both of them were due to my own stupidity. Because I've met, one time I ministered 40 times in one week. And then I ministered 41 times the next week. And... You just can't do stuff like that. And so I wore myself out and I got tired and I crawled. I literally had to crawl into bed and laid there for 24 hours trying to recover. And I felt pretty good after 24 hours and I went out and split a cord of wood and I did too much too soon and I got a sinus headache. And then another time I came back after being uh, awake for 36 hours on an overseas trip and my pond had plugged up and so in the winter in Colorado I got in freezing cold water after 36 hours with no sleep and tried to unplug the drain and I got a cold. And those are the only two things I've had in 48 years. And that was because of stupidity again. You have to learn to cooperate, amen. But I don't believe in getting sick. I don't get sick. I will not get sick. Amen. And I know some of you are already like, this is weird. Well, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm not mad at you. God loves you. I love you. But I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. I'm telling you, God wants you well. It is God's will. He purchased healing for you. Don't feel condemned by that, but instead feel encouraged that the Lord died to produce healing for you. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 52, and let me just illustrate this with Scripture here. Isaiah chapter 52, and in verse 14, and I wish I had time to put this in its context. I, I haven't got time to do that, but if you study this, this is talking about Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53 is the famous Scripture's about how he bore our sorrows and carried our griefs. And in chapter 52, verse 14, it says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. The word visage means face. His face was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. The NIV says so that he didn't even look human. You know, I, I saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, with Mel Gibson, that he did that. And, you know, I, I'm not criticizing what he did at all because he, you know, he was limited with just video and stuff like this. But it was rated uh, R. He said that if he would have made it the way he really believed it was, it would have been X-rated and they wouldn't have, nobody would have come to see it. So he had to tone it down. But did you know that when Jesus hung on the cross, he was still recognizable as a human being? But this verse says that his form was marred so that he didn't even look human. We don't have a full understanding of what Jesus went through. But I don't believe that any Roman beating caused the things that is being described here. It was, I'm, although I'm not minimizing what happened to Jesus being beaten by the Romans and crucified, that was terrible. But what was really bad is that every sickness, every disease that has ever hit the human race entered into the physical body of Jesus. 
the things that you're dealing with, your pain, anything that you're dealing with, it all came into the body of Jesus. He bore our sicknesses and carried our diseases. You know, I had people, I had two guys come up to me in Kansas City and one of them had a cancer on his face and he had a towel over his face and he was asking me to pray for him and I couldn't understand him and I said look I'm sorry but you're gonna have to remove the towel I can't understand what you're saying when he took the towel away cancer had eaten his nose off and his lips and and it was terrible looking and in that same meeting I had a man come who cancer had eaten out the man's eyeball and it had taken over half of his face and he just had this huge cancer on his face it was terrible looking the Bible says Jesus' face was marred more than that, more than any man. Jesus' face had cancers and tumors and, and heads that had swollen. And, and uh, you know, I've seen pictures of people with elephantitis, how their body swells and all kinds of things happen. Jesus had everything that has ever hit the human race happen to his physical body so that when he hung on the cross, he didn't even look human. He didn't just forgive us of our sins, as important as that is. I'm not minimizing that, but he died to produce physical healing in your body. And if you are suffering with sickness and disease, you are leaving something, a gift that Jesus purchased at great expense for you, and you're leaving it on the table. You know, if for some reason I had loved you enough and if I could have died and borne your sickness and disease and if I went through that suffering and then you just chose not to receive it because after all what was really important was getting your sins forgiven and you were just going to leave the sickness and disease and live that way, that wouldn't please me. It would be like I went through this for nothing. I did this for you and it's like a gift and you aren't receiving it. I'm not saying this to scold anybody. I'm saying it that God was as concerned about your physical body and your healing as he was about your forgiveness of sins. And yet it's not been presented this way. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And because it hasn't been presented this way, there's a lot of people. And I, I know that Dwayne is a great minister. I've known him for a long time. But I know that there's people sitting right here that to you, healing is optional. It's not. It is a part of your atonement. He wants you well as much as he wants you forgiven of sins. In the same way as you wouldn't compromise on that. You wouldn't just go live in sin because, well, I tried. I asked God to help me not commit adultery, but the desire still came. I think I'll go ahead and do it. No, it's, it's a fight, and sometimes you have to resist. You know what? You need to get to where you resist sickness. You need to hate sickness as much as you hate adultery as much as you hate lying, as much as you hate anything. I hate sickness. You know, I used to come with Dave Duell every year to Res Life. Any of you old enough to remember Dave Duell and me coming? And Dave Duell was a crazy man. And I remember one time it was over in another auditorium, but it was, it was high like this. And there was a little woman that came up on a walker and she had arthritis and Dave was getting ready to pray for her and he was making this exact point. You got to hate sickness. I hate sickness. I hate arthritis. And he saw this woman down there and he says, I hate you arthritis. And he runs and jumps and in midair he realized he had miscalculated <laughs> and he landed on top of this woman. And she was on a walker, and they went rolling, and, and he says that Grandma wound up on his, he, he was on the bottom, and she was on top. And he was thinking, oh, my lawsuit or something like that. But God touched her, and she got up and ran around the church, and God healed, praise God. You don't have to jump on people, but you got to hate sickness. You got to hate it, and yet some of you don't hate it. You embrace it. You talk about my sickness. You talk about my pains and my... You know, the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The word resist means to actively fight against. You got to hate sickness. Hate it. Not hate the person, but hate sickness. I just had uh, on my television programs, I had a woman that who, whose two sons were healed of autism 
And this is one of the points that made her sons get healed. Her son was so autistic, he would scream, wouldn't wear clothes, couldn't leave the house, and was totally healed. And last week we just had a musical debut, and this boy who used to be autistic that he couldn't leave the house and, and had just been terrible, he, he now was the star in our show. He was playing God in this show. I told him, I said, man, that's pretty awesome coming from where you couldn't sleep, do anything, to now you're playing God. Not many people can do that. But, you know, one of the things that made that difference was she was in England, and the people were telling her, you need to embrace autism. If you hate autism, you hate your son. This is your son. He is autistic, and you've got to embrace this and recognize this as the way it was. And Deborah got mad and told them, no, I will not embrace autism. Autism is trying to kill my sons. And she says, I hate autism. And she stood up, and because of that, her two boys have now been totally freed by the English uh, Na National Health Care Service. They are just awesome and totally set free because she didn't embrace it. She didn't accept it. The worst thing you can do is accept your sickness and disease and say, well, this is just my lot in life. And again, we could spend time on every one of these things. There are people that say this is how God moves in your life. This is God teaching you something. This is the way He humbles you. That's a lie. I'd be gentler if I had more time. I'm just telling you that's a lie. Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy. God is not the author of sickness and disease. It is not God's will. God hates sickness, and if you would hate sickness and resist it, that is one of the very first things to seeing healing come to pass in your life. You've got to know that this is God's will, that there is no way God is using this and put it on you to teach you something. This is Satan trying to come to steal, to kill, and to destroy and so you've got to have an absolute assurance that by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. Wish we had time to go through every one of these verses. But look in the 53rd chapter. The first few verses here are saying, who hath believed our report? You know, there's people that just can't believe what I'm saying. They can't believe that God Almighty would come down here and take every sickness, every disease... Every problem of the human race in his body. Why would God do that? And it says that when we see him, there's no beauty in him. There's nothing in Jesus that we should desire him. You know, again, if for some how or not, if I could imagine being God, and I love the human race enough to come to the human race and die for them, and if I became a man, I guarantee you, I would have been the greatest specimen of human flesh that you had ever seen. I would have been bigger, taller. I'd have made Hercules look pitiful compared to me. And yet this says that Jesus, there was no beauty in him. There was nothing that we should desire him. Jesus was as plain as any person in here. I don't believe he was necessarily ugly, but there was nothing special about Jesus. There is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, Jesus suffered not only on the cross and not only when he got beaten by the Romans. But just think, here you are, God Almighty, and you're walking by people every day and they don't even notice you. You know, that's suffering. You're the one that created them and nobody even notices you. You were so plain that no, there was nothing special about you. Jesus Bore. If any of you feel like you're just plain and like there's nothing special about you, I guarantee you Jesus felt all of that. People didn't recognize him. He suffered the entire time being limited to a physical body and walking around. But it says he, bore, he did this. He bore our sorrows and he carried our griefs. He didn't bear his sorrows. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. There was nothing for him to suffer for. He suffered for us. Everything that Jesus suffered, he suffered for us. And so in chapter 53 and in verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. If Jesus bore my sorrows and grief, then I'm not going to bear them. I refuse to bear them. Again, I know that some people won't understand what I'm saying. Praise God for Pastor Dwayne. He'll straighten all this out when I am gone and explain it. 
But, you know, when my son died and we were told that he was dead, my wife and I prayed, and we, it took us an hour to get up and drive into town, and we didn't have cell phones back in 2001. And so we didn't know what was happening, and I started to feel grief and sorrow the way that anybody would if you were told that your son was dead. But you know what? Jesus bore my griefs and carried my sorrows, and I said, I'm not going to do it. I refused to grieve, and I started praising God. And I tell you, that was a key in my son being raised from the dead. If I would have embraced sorrow and grief and had started carrying it myself, I don't believe my son would have come back from the dead. But Jesus bore my sorrows and grief. Now, I'm not saying that you don't miss a person if they've died and gone on, but you, there's a difference between grieving the way the world grieves where you're just devastated and just loving a person and missing them. So this says he bore our sorrows and carried our grief. If he did that, I'm not going to carry him. I refuse to carry him. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> I know some of oh, I can't believe you're saying this. That's the reason you bear sorrows and grief is because you accept it. To you it's acceptable. This is normal. This is the way you've been taught. As you think in your heart, that's the way you are. And so that's the reason you're experiencing it. And in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Man, if my peace, if he was bruised and wounded so that I could have peace, well then I'm going to have peace. I am not going to go around. I, it's been now nearly 50 years since I've been depressed. I don't get depressed. I don't believe in being depressed. And some of you, well, I just don't believe that. Well, that's the reason you're depressed. <laughs> I'm not against you. I love you, but I'm telling you the truth so that you can be set free. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as, as a sheep before our shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Contrary to the, uh, that movie, I forgot what it was, Tom Hanks' movie about some code where he married Mary Magdalene and had kids. Here's the scripture thing on this. Nobody can declare his generation because he didn't have kids. Any of you that saw that movie and gave to help promote that, shame on you. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise, bruise him. What a statement. It pleased the father to bruise his son. It didn't please him in the sense that he enjoyed seeing Jesus suffer, but he loved you and me so much that it pleased him to sacrifice his son for us. And again, not just for the forgiveness of your sins, but so that your body could be healed. He didn't want you to suffer pain. He doesn't want you to suffer with things. God loves you so much, He doesn't want you to have this. He actually was pleased for His Son to become so marred that His face looked worse than any person who has ever lived on this planet. His body was so brutalized that it didn't even look human. You couldn't recognize it was a person hanging on the cross. He did that for you because He loves you and He wants you well. And yet we tolerate things that Jesus died to forgive us of, to set us free of. That's not good. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God punished his own son so that you would not have to be punished, not only from sin but from sickness and from all of these things. You know, in the Old Testament, when a person sinned, they had to bring an, a sacrifice, a lamb, because the wages of sin is death. And so you have to die if you sin. If you've sinned even in the smallest thing, James chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. 
So if you've lived a relatively holy life, but if you've sinned at all, death is the wage of sin. And under the old covenant, because of the goodness and the mercy of God, he allowed us to kill an animal and substitute its death for our death. But that was only a picture and a shadow of the true lamb of God that was to come. But when you sinned, you brought a lamb before the priest. And man, this is powerful. Did you know that when you sinned and brought a lamb, the very fact that you were bringing a lamb was an indication that you had sinned. You were confessing that you had sinned. You were not proclaiming your goodness. You were proclaiming your sin. And when you brought this lamb before the priest, the priest didn't examine you. They didn't say, you sorry thing. How could you have done this? They examined the lamb. The lamb had to be without spot and blemish, not you. And if the lamb was, was without spot, God saw the travail of the lamb's soul and he credited it to you. Did you know that we have come before the Lord and every one of us have sinned? There's not any of us in here that deserve God's goodness. You don't deserve it. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God looks at the Lamb. And He is healing you because of what Jesus has done. Not because you deserve it. There's a lot of people that believe God can heal, but they think that healing is tied to their goodness. And if they don't feel like they've done everything right, well, then they lose all of their confidence. You know, I told you about my son being raised from the dead, my wife being raised from the dead. I've seen many people raised from the dead. And most of you believe that. That's the reason you come to this church instead of some other church. You believe in the supernatural healing power of God. If somebody was to fall over dead here today and I said, well, I've seen people raised from the dead. I'm going to pray and praise God. We'll see them raised from the dead. Most of you would be right with me. Amen. You'd clap. Amen. But you know where I'd lose the majority of you? I say, all right, if you believe it, you come up here and pray for them. And all of a sudden, what happened? You were excited about seeing somebody raised from the dead as long as I'm the one praying for them. But when I say you come pray for them, your faith turns to fear, your excitement turns to dread. What happened? Did God change all of a sudden? No, but when you get factored into it, you lose your confidence because most of us think that God only moves in our life when we're worthy of it. And you know you aren't worthy of it. You might look at Dwayne or me or somebody else and think, well, you're a preacher and you got your act together. If you knew me as well as you know you, you wouldn't have any more faith in my prayers than you got in your prayers. <laughs> I have to use the name of Jesus to get my prayers answered. Amen. I don't deserve anything. But see, you feel unworthy and like you know God can heal. You don't doubt that God raised my son from the dead, but would it work for you? Well, you need to recognize God isn't examining you. He's examining the lamb. It's the lamb that purchased healing for you. It's not your goodness. If you're the worst saint in here, if you are living the sorriest life, you have had the atonement made for your perfect healing. And if you could get out of putting faith in yourself and put faith in a Savior, you could be healed exactly the same as anybody else. One of the reasons people don't get healed, I've heard people say this before, they'll see somebody come down and a, a drunk off the street comes in and gets totally healed of something miraculously. And here's dear old Saint so-and-so on the first row that has been believing God for the healing of the same thing. And they just can't understand, why did God heal them? And I've been praying and fast. I go to church. I give tithes. I give pies to people when they have a death in the family. I've done all of this. How come God hasn't healed me? You just told me. Because, see, you didn't point to what Jesus, you didn't point to the Lamb, you pointed to yourself, and you were trying to earn God's healing power through your goodness. And that's the very thing that stops the power of God. If God gave you what you deserved, you'd go to hell. I'm talking about as a believer. And somebody, I can't believe you said that. You don't know who I am. Well, you know what? The attitude you got about me right now, it, that's wrong. Amen. <laughs> You're sinning. I'm your brother, whether you like it or not. And the things that you're thinking about me are wrong. If you got what you deserved, you wouldn't get anything. I'm telling you, you don't come before God on the basis of your goodness. 
When it comes to salvation, we sing just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And we come and put our total faith in Jesus. And if I had a word of knowledge and said, God shows me that you've committed adultery, instead of that keeping you from being born again, if you truly heard the gospel, you would say, man, that's the reason I need salvation. And you would go ahead and believe and receive, even though you were in a, caught in the very act of adultery. But, Get born again and come up here. And if I had a word of knowledge, you didn't study the word today. You haven't been doing your daily Bible readings. Some of you, oh man, now I know why God isn't answering my prayers. See, you get born again without looking at yourself, putting faith in a Savior. But when it comes to receiving healing or something, we think that somehow or another we've got to be worthy and earn it. Nobody's ever earned it. It's not based on what you've done. It's based on what Jesus has done for you. Jesus has paid for your healing just as much as he paid for your forgiveness of sins. If you have believed for salvation and if you have received salvation, you should also be able to receive healing of your body. Seeing a person raised from the dead physically is inferior to seeing a person raised from the dead spiritually. The greatest miracle you'll ever have is to see a person born again. And if you've received that, well, then healing is yours. It's the children's bread. It belongs to you, but you've got to fight for it. You've got to change your attitude. You've got to resist the devil before he'll flee from you. And I tell you, most Christians are where they would like to be healed, but you know what? They can make it without it. We've got the American Disabilities Act, and so we now accommodate people with with things and you know what one of the reasons you see so many more people healed in foreign countries is because they don't have a social system that is going to pay them money if they can't work they don't have all of the disability they don't have handicapped access and these people are desperate and because of it they are resisting and fighting Americans have become so that we can accommodate it you can take a pill you can deal with things I'm telling you you need to start fighting like Jesus has provided healing for you. You can take a pill and overcome a headache. I'm not against you. You can do that. But when is it that you're going to start exercising your faith? When is it you're going to start believing God? Are you going to wait until cancer comes and you got stage 4 cancer and the doctor says you're going to die and then you're going to start believing God? But you've never believed Him for a headache. You've never believed Him for a pain. You've never stood for anything. It's not the way that it works. You can't just wait until the day of a marathon and start training. You need to practice. You need to work up to it. You need to take these scriptures. I'm encouraging you today that you need to see that healing is not optional. I'm not saying that you won't go to heaven if you don't believe in healing. But I'm just saying you'll get there quicker <laughs> if you don't believe in healing. You can still go to heaven, but you'll get there a lot quicker if you don't believe in healing. God wants you well. God wants to heal you, but he needs some cooperation from you. You need to cooperate with God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I've shared truths with you today that if you will receive it, this will plant a seed of healing in your life. You may have to uh, let it grow. You may have to meditate on this and strengthen it, but I guarantee you we've planted a seed that could produce healing in your body. And you know, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Jesus, man, it would be a shame for me to have talked about how that Jesus became a man and lived on this earth and died for us and suffered so much, not just for the healing of our body, but he suffered so that you could know him, so that you could be forgiven of your sins. It would be a shame for you to hear this message and not respond to it. You need to respond. You need to make Jesus your personal Savior if you haven't done that. And once you get born again, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does a lot of things. Speaking in tongues is a part of that. But also the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he says you would receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I tell you, when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, power began to manifest in my life. I wouldn't have seen my son and my wife raised from the dead if I hadn't have had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you don't speak in tongues, it's like charging hell with a water pistol. You need power 
in your life. And Jesus said, you receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And one of the greatest things that the baptism of the Holy Spirit did in my life, it just unveiled the Word. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. And it's not written to your head. Even though you use your head when you read, it's really written to your heart. It has to come by revelation. And when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, He's the one that wrote the Bible and He reveals it to you. The Word comes alive. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, I guarantee you, you need that. Every person in here needs to be born again. You need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongues. So if there's anybody here tonight who, uh, this morning who doesn't have one or both of those things, I would like to specifically pray for you because that's a starting point. You can't go very far without, you can't go anywhere without, first of all, knowing Jesus and receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here who would say, man, that's me. I need prayer. I want to receive. If that's you, I want you just to raise your hand wherever you are. Be bold. Man, we got hands all over the place. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I'd like to ask everybody to stand, and if you raised your hand, or if you were supposed to raise your hand and didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward, and we want to pray with you right here and help you to receive this morning. So wherever you are, if you're up in the balcony or anywhere, please come down and let us pray with you and help you to receive this morning. Praise God. Man, let's praise God for all of these. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I believe this is going to change your life. You're going to leave this place stronger than horseradish. <laughs> Changed my life. You know, I'm just going to pray for you quickly, and then I'm, we've got some people here that will take you, and we've got a book that we want to give you. We've got materials that we want to give you that will explain all of this and people that will pray with you. But I believe that God is going to touch your life today. Amen. They're going to go that way. All right. Father, we just thank you right now for all of these. Thank you, Father, for touching these hearts, and I know that you love each one of them, that you want them saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we just thank you. And right now, we pray and agree with them that, Father, this is going to be a life-changing experience, that they will leave this place totally transformed today through the power of God. So thank you for touching their hearts. And as they go, Father, we believe that you touch everyone and they get exactly what they need here today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.